Hey, good morning. Yeah. I'm sorry. All right, good morning, everyone. Morning. Good morning. It's a great day to serve the Lord. This is the day that the Lord has made. We can be glad and rejoice in it. So let's pray, first of all. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We pray, Lord, that you help us understand it more. And I ask, Lord, that you open up our understanding. Help us, Lord, to receive from you. We thank you, Lord, for the anointing of the Holy Spirit, both for speaking and also for receiving, listening to the voice of the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, today we're going to learn a Hebrew word. The word is Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah Jireh, who can tell me what it means? Some of you know, you can't say anything. <laughs> That's right here. It means the Lord will provide. The Lord will provide. Sometimes in life we kind of wonder. We can pray, we can ask God, we can see things that we need. But we wonder if we're going to get them. We wonder if God's going to provide it. And so today we're going to supposedly learn something about that. All right, first of all, I want to open up this morning with reading Isaiah 51, 1 to 2. It tells us to do something. Isaiah, I think, was one of the, the best prophets because he always spoke uh, about God, about the uh, those who would follow righteousness. And he always preached about it. So he says, listen to me, you who follow after righteousness, you who seek the Lord, look to the rock from which you were hewn, and to the hole of the pit from which you were dug. Look to Abraham your father, and to Sarah who bore you. For I called him alone, and blessed him, and increased him. So two things, three things we're supposed to get from this, we're supposed to listen. Listen to the Word of God that says, you who follow righteousness. Now, who in here is actually following righteousness? Is it all of you? Are you following after righteousness that you would attain it, receive it? The Bible says that Jesus becomes our righteousness and that we can receive it as a gift. So I hope that we are seeking that. We're following after the gift of righteousness because our righteousness, as you know, has faults. Our righteousness is not perfect, but His righteousness is perfect. Mm -hmm. Then He says, you who seek the Lord. Are you willing to seek the Lord? There's one place where He says, you must seek with all your heart. If you desire to know me, mm -hmm. seek the Lord with all your heart, and you shall find. And look to the rock from which you were hewn. Mm -hmm. You know, when they go to the quarry and they have rocks and they're, they're breaking them, mm -hmm. cutting them so that they could put in the temple or some building, they have to dig out. And uh, according to this, our lives are kind of like dug out from the solid rock. Solid rock. So look to Abraham, also your father. Well, why do they say, why does Isaiah here say, 
that he is your father. He is called the father of faith. Father of faith. The Bible says that God, uh, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness. And he is called the father of faith. So we can follow someone who is believing like that and following the Lord. So today we will look at Abraham's life and his faith. He is called the father of faith. He's also called the friend of God. The friend of God. As we study about Abraham, we see that sometimes he even talked back to God. Sometimes he would ask him a hard question, especially at Sodom and Gomorrah. You remember that? He talked to God like, the God of the universe shall do right. If, if you can find 50 uh, righteous people in Sodom, will you not destroy it? And he went on down all the way to 10. He bargained with God. So sometimes a friend will do that. We'll talk with someone very close. And we need to learn to talk to God that way. But we have to be smart about it. You know, sometimes we get a little angry because we think that things are not going for our life as it should. But we have to be patient and we have to approach God with, with grace. So, uh, Abraham was first approached by, uh, Abraham was first approached, God approached him by telling him to leave his country, his people, and the father's house, and go to the land that he would show him. God said, I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing and all the families of the earth will be blessed through you. Wow, this is a proclamation over, a pro prophecy over Abraham that God was willing to do. And he said, to leave his country. Why would he leave his country? Leave his home, leave his father's house, so that he could go to another land. I know that sometimes God calls us out from our familiar place so that we can go to a place that he can actually really work with us, talk with us, and give us a new life. You know that when we come to Christ, we have to come out of our old life and move into the new life. The Bible says all things have become new. The old has passed away. Actually, Abraham's father in probably most of his family, were idol worshipers. Someone said that they were idol makers too. We don't know. I don't know that. But in the history book, somebody said something like that. So they worshiped idols. They didn't know God at that point. That's why God said, come out from there. And I'll go to a place that I will show you. Another point is, sometimes... Uh, we have to go out to follow God and not know where you're going. Hebrews 11 verse 8 says, let's read it together. By faith, Abram obeyed when he was called to go out to a place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. You know that's the Christian life. That's like the Christian life, the Christian experience. God calls us out to a place just like he called the fishermen at the shore of Galilee. He said, come, follow me. They didn't know where they're going. They just start following. When you become a Christian, you're not sure where you're going. Are you? You've never been there before. So you have to have God show you and take you to this new place. And that's what he was doing with Abram. He told him to leave his house and his father's house and go to the land that he would be shown. And God said, I will make you a great nation, a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. And all the families of earth will be blessed through you. That's an important point right there. All the families of earth. Are you part of the families of earth? 
Yes, you are. We all are. And God promises that through Abraham, he was going to be a blessing. You know, Abraham was not a Jew. He was a Gentile like many of you, or many of us. But he was, he became the father of faith because he believed God. He wasn't perfect, but he, uh, he followed God with, and obeyed God with, with a very strong inclination that he would follow him. So let your Christian experience be led by the Holy Spirit. Led by God, because you haven't been there before. There was a disciple that asked Jesus, Lord, how can we know the way? And he said, what did he say? I am the way. I am the way. So we need to just follow Christ and follow God, and he will make us a true blessing to be a blessing to others. In Genesis 15, verse 1, after these things, the word of the Lord to Abram came to in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram, I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. I am your El Shaddai, which is another Hebrew name, which means the God, all-sufficient God, or the God that uh, more than enough. And I will meet your needs and provide for you. So here God is contacting Abraham and moving him forward into more of a deeper relationship so that he would get to know the Almighty God, the El Shaddai, which is God who is more than enough. You know, you can't outgive God, and he's more than enough. The Lord is our shepherd. We shall not want. You don't have to want when God is in charge. So by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out. And after these things, God reminded him that he was the shield, the great reward. God is a great reward. And uh, he's more than enough for what we need. He will meet all of your needs and provide for you, just the same as he did for Abraham. Then God moved a little bit deeper in his life. And he cut covenant with Abraham. The word for covenant means to cut. That's why the blood was flowing. When Jesus went to the cross and he fulfilled the new covenant so that God would be able to save the whole world. He came to save the whole world. So he cut covenant. God is a covenant God. And there are various things that are in a covenant. What is a covenant? A good example is a marriage covenant. You know about that? <laughs> uh, a year ago. <laughs> it's already a whole year for them. It's over 40-something for us. <laughs> but, covenant is an agreement or contract that can be sealed and confirmed by blood. Some of the elements of blood covenant are as follows. The offering up of sacrifice with blood becomes a blood covenant. Now, you can have an agreement without blood, but the, when, in the Old Covenant, Old Testament, they would, they would cut each other and put the blood together somehow. There are many different rituals and so forth. But God is a covenant God, and he used to, he's very uh, into using the blood covenant. The Old Testament, they used blood. The New Testament... They confirmed it by blood. And Jesus did. And he went to the cross and he said, it is finished. So offering up a sacrifice with blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Exchanging of gifts to each other. 
Now you can think of this as the uh, marriage covenant. Do you, do you exchange gifts? You speak promises to each other, oath, and saying, all mine is yours now, and all yours is mine. Jesus said the same thing. He said that all that the Father has is mine, and all that I have is His. So we need to understand that connection of covenant, how committed that makes you be with Almighty God. Jesus has confirmed the new covenant. When we take communion, we take the cup that says, this is my blood of the new covenant. Take this in remembrance of me. So promises cannot be broken or divorced. God doesn't like divorce. It, it does happen. People get divorced, but uh, his first desire is that the covenant that you make will last forever, last till death, and the covenant is until death. Jesus overcame death so that he through death might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. That's from Hebrews 2, verse 14. But Abraham told God, he said, what do you give me seeing I go childless? He didn't have a child. He didn't have a son. Because Abraham had no children, and I'm sure he was wondering if God was really going to provide a son. After all, Abraham and his wife Sarai were already too old to have children. Now the name Abram, which was what he was called first, means exalted father. So how would you like to be called the exalted father when you didn't have a child? Think about that. And the word of the Lord came to him saying, Eliezer, your servant will not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. So God promised Abram a son, and he changed his name from Abram to Abraham. From now on you shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations, a father of a multitude. That's amazing. He's called what he's to be. In the Bible, a lot of the names that people give names to their children are what they are supposed to end up being. This is who they are. And now he has said, I have made you. I have made you a father of many nations. So then he brought him outside and said, look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. Have you ever tried to count the stars? No. You give up? You give up? <laughs> he said, see if you can number them. And then he said to him, so shall your descendants be. Abram believed in the Lord, and God accounted it to him as his righteousness. So he believed. Abraham believed. <laughs> Just think, looking up at the stars, start counting. He said, this is how many offspring you're going to end up with. And I was thinking, there's how many people in the world now? Seven billion plus? Maybe closer to eight billion now, I don't know. But there's a lot of people that are yet to be saved. There are a lot of people that are already saved. They believe in Jesus and they've committed their life to Him. So Abraham believed the impossible, and he hoped against hope. This means that the promise became alive within him, even though there was nothing to see in the realm of the natural. Therefore, he closed his eyes to this world, and he believed to see the fulfillment of God's promise. He trusted in the one who gives life to the dead and calls those who... Uh, in which be not as though they were. God calls things that they become like a father of many nations, a father of a multitude. So all many nations would come from him. Romans 4, 17 to 19 says, He did not weaken in faith, it's talking about Abraham, when he considered his own body, 
which was about a hundred years old. And when he considered the deadness of Sarah's womb, he did not stumble over the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith. And he gave glory to God, fully persuaded that God was able to do what he had promised, that he would end up with a child. And that is why his faith was accounted to him as righteousness. So Abraham took, he looked after God's ability to do that, what he had promised. And the Bible says that faith is the substance of things not, uh, substance of things hoped for, the ev evidence of things not seen. That means he focused on the, what God said and not what he could see. It also says in the Bible, we walk by faith, not by sight. He was a man who walked by faith in God all the time. And he always obeyed. So no wonder he's called the father of faith. Father of faith. So in, I want to read some from the Bible that uh, tells a story that happened next. It's from Genesis 22. Just listen to, I don't have it up here, but listen to it. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, he said, here I am. So this is after Isaac was born. And he's calling Abraham to do something. Then he said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah. Offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and he arose and went to the place of which God had told him. So he's already, he's going to obey even though this thing is hard. This is a test. He just received his new son. He was, how old was he, Dana? 12 or so? Isaac? Yeah. He's supposed to be 13. 13. So he's 13 years old, and God says, offer him on Moriah, Mount Moriah, as an offering. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. That is a statement of faith. We will come back to you. Remember that. He says, we, we will come back to you. So Abraham knew what, I think he knew what God was going to do. And Abraham said to his young man, stay here. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham his father and said, My father? And he said, Here I am, my son. He said, Look, the fire, the wood, but where's the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. And when they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there, placed the wood in order, and he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the lad. Do do not anything to him, for now I know that you fear God. When I read that the first time ever, I thought God was telling him what God was going to do. He did. He showed that he was willing to do what God himself was going to do with his son. Now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. 
Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by its horn. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. So here is the lesson that we're learning today. Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day. The Lord will provide. In this story, there is no clear picture of the cross, the crucifixion, and the resurrection of Jesus, the Son of God. It is an Old Testament picture of a New Testament event. God was showing his plan of redemption to Abraham. When God had earlier prophesied to Abraham that through him all the families of the earth would be blessed, he was declaring that the Messiah would be coming through Abraham. He was preaching about the good news that Jesus would be coming as the Lamb of God, which would take away the sins of the whole world. So there are many similarities between Isaac and Jesus, who both were offspring and heirs of Abraham. The Messiah is coming through Abraham, and Abraham believed God by faith. It was accounted to him as righteousness. Isaac, therefore, was truly a type of Christ. Let us now look at some of the comparisons of Isaac and Jesus. Number one, both were the father's only begotten son. Number two, both were promised by God. Number three, both had their birth pre-announced and named before birth. Both were mocked and crucified. Isaac symbolically was crucified. He, there was a uh, there was a lamb there took his place both were sacrificed near the same place Golgotha is very close to Moriah I don't know if it's the same but it's exactly in the same location both were loved and pleased by their father both had a three day experience it took three days to walk from where Abraham was to Mount Moriah it took three days for Jesus to rise. And both carried the wood and they were laid upon it. Jesus was laid on the cross and it was raised up. Isaac was laid on the wood for the sacrifice. Both asked their father, where was the lamb for the sacrifice? Both were brought back to life again. The resurrection was indicated through this this story and Abraham understood it so he's really called a friend of God he's really called a friend of God <clears throat> so Isaac asked his father where is the lamb and God said or I mean Abraham said God will provide. The Lord will provide what's needed. Let me look at now the scripture in the New Testament for us to meditate on. We can take it with us. It's something to memorize and go. Philippians 4.19 says, My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Say it again. Yeah. Let's everybody say it together. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So now we're going to listen to a song. It's an old song. I know how to sing it, but you ready? Yes. If you know it, sing it with us. Yeah. 
you, Lord. Let's pray. Father God, thank you, Lord, for the example of Abraham, his life, his faith. Help us, Lord, to, to walk as people who are obedient as he was. And thank you, Lord, for uh, bringing us, providing everything, Lord, that we need. We ask, Lord, that you take care of us. Take care of everyone in our families. Take care of the, the situations that we're involved in right now. We pray, Lord, that you would watch over us and uh, restore us according to the grace that is sufficient for us. Thank you, Lord, for meeting all of our needs. In Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen. Anyone have announcements? You have? Announcement? I don't have a bullet. Oh, well, tomorrow we'll be working here. Tomorrow. I mean, next, next week. Next week. <laughs> next week we will be worshiping here. That's the uh, 14th. Get up. Get up. We do have the opportunity to, to bless the whole church. And um, we want to also, just I just encourage you to be alert. Uh, if there's somebody that comes your way, mm -hmm. I'm glad you're here today. Uh, what good thing can you say to one another that will bless the people and will enable them to uh, feel welcome? And it's okay. And then I want to encourage you to be praying about a few things. Next week, there's going to be another start, thing that starts. At, right after lunch, the, there will be a special Bible study for the juniors and seniors. And so be praying that there will be uh, people that are really encouraged and really want to be a part of the, the group and will learn a lot. And so from next, next Sunday, We'll start at 1045 in here. Mm -hmm. We will have our own English only uh, worship time, uh, singing praises to our God. Uh, and then we'll have English only service the rest of the rest of it. So uh, <laughs> I, I hope that it blesses all the Chinese too because they won't have to sit and listen to it both. Most of them can sit, he, uh, speak both and so they have to listen to it in Chinese and in English both. So this time they'll be able just to relax and, and uh, hear only by Chinese. Also be in prayer uh, that as we prepare to be at our retreat. We haven't been able to go to a retreat for several years because of COVID. And this year we get to ha have a chance to go to the Sky, Sky Ranch in Miami, Oklahoma, which is way up there in the northeast corner. And uh, so be in prayer that there be a lot of people involved and that everyone will be blessed. I encourage you to follow the uh, scripture readings there because if we read these scriptures together, then we'll be in, in a type of unity every day. Because each one of us will be uh, studying the same scriptures. Hope that you, if, if you see a need, uh, somebody asks you to serve uh, our church, I hope that you will be willing to say, yes, I will. And so I encourage you to do that. Now I'd like to pray over the food. Lord, we just thank you very much for providing for us. You've been working on this meal for a long time, and so I pray, oh Lord, that you would uh, bless the people who partake of it, bless the food that have been good nourishment for our bodies, and we want to give you the praise. We want to give you the thanks in Jesus' holy and righteous name. Amen. Amen. May you be blessed.
Wait, uh, is it stuck? 